Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to join you for the Breakfast of Champions today. You know, I'm used to giving talks about uh, Mercy programs, and but when Jennifer Johns, when she was still executive director at UROC, uh, asked me to do this talk, I told her the Mercy programs that I was going to talk about, and she said, you know, we really don't want to hear about Mercy programs. We want to hear about you and your life and your life story. And I said, okay. And then I wondered to myself, have I already agreed to do this? Uh, starting to feel pretty uncomfortable because I'm really not accustomed to talking about myself. Uh, as I said, I'm used to talking about mercy and giving academic oriented talks in healthcare. But uh, one of my favorite people in Janesville, Audrey McCollin, wanted me to be here today, so of course I accepted. I can tell you that uh, I'm not sure Raleigh would have been able to get me to do this, but uh, for Audrey, how could I say no? So thank you for having me. Well, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois. My dad was a printer for the Rockford newspaper, and my mom cared for me, my five brothers, and six sisters. And all six of us boys slept in one bedroom on three sets of bunk beds lining three walls. And to tell you the truth, it was a little bit like growing up in an army barracks. Um, <laughs> it, it be, in fact, when one of my older brothers went off uh, to army boot camp, he uh, wrote back and said that some of the guys would cry in their bunks at night because they thought the drill sergeant was so uh, tough. Uh, he said, but compared to dad, I, didn't, I don't find him bad at all. <laughs> so uh, being the youngest of six boys, I did grow up fast. My parents were very hard workers, but with so many children, money was hard to come by, and I learned at an early age that I had to work if I wanted anything. I had my first paper route at age eight and three paper routes by age 11. I delivered one route, hired two friends to deliver the other two, and I collected for all three. I also, I also had a regular list of lawn mowing and snow shoveling customers, and uh, I used the money, and I hired friends to help me with that. So I had a little business going, a uh, lawn service business, but I used the money I made to buy all my own clothes and a good part of my uh, parochial school tuition. I do remember summers, though, a good memory that I've got is on Sundays during the summer after church, my father would drive our station wagon to Janesville and we'd have a day outing at Lions Beach. I still have fond memories of Janesville as a boy from these outings. Uh, but I also remember that at dinner time with 12 growing children, sometimes there just didn't seem to be enough food to go around and I know some of us kids and I'm sure my parents would go to bed sometimes without our bellies completely full. We had, um, they didn't pay printers too much in those days and so all of us learned to ration and share uh, from an early age. Uh, we had one bathroom for all 14 of us so we learned to take very quick showers. Uh, I can guarantee, especially with six girls in the family. Uh, when I was ready for high school, the parish priest approached my parents and picked me and one of my brothers to go to, go to two different college preparatory seminaries. I was, uh, the diocese paid for all the costs and I was sent to one in Crystal Lake, Illinois, run by the Franciscan Friars. And life in the minor seminary uh, was a real formative experience. Uh, I learned many things. I remember the fathers had strict rules of silence after night prayers. One night I broke this rule by simply asking my roommate if he could spare a bit of toothpaste. That night the prefect or priest was walking by and so he told me to go out and kneel in the hallway on the floor. Sometime during the night I got a not so gentle nudge telling me I could go to bed. The idea was to teach discipline and the value of silence. I was 13 years old. But it, what it also taught me was that sometimes things are not as simple as they may seem. I did learn one other thing, and that is trazzle floors are really hard. And so, <laughs> so when it came time to put the new addition on uh, the front of the hospital, I told Dave Kurtz, let's put trazzle floors in because they'll last forever because they're really hard. <laughs> and, I, and I remember that. <clears throat> and so we did. But my family had to be very frugal and uh, couldn't afford tooth decay and cavities. And so I felt that you know, breaking the rule and asking my roommate for toothpaste was the right thing to do, even if there wasn't supposed to be any talking after night prayers. And I think that what I'm saying is that sometimes doing the right things uh, can uh, be painful uh, and have painful consequences, but I think this is where courage and uh, faith comes in. Faith that if you do the right thing, things will turn out the way they're supposed to. Maybe not the way you want, but the way they're supposed to. 
As I developed at the seminary, I began to realize that my higher calling uh, might not be to the priesthood. And uh, so, but some, maybe some kind of helping profession. I left the seminary, finished high school at Auburn High School in Rockford, Illinois. And while at Auburn, I was on a work, um, kind of a study work program where I attended classes from seven in the morning to noon, and then I uh, worked from one to five. And I started working at Rockford Memorial Hospital in the housekeeping department. And my job was to clean and mop uh, the floors of the radiology and physical therapy department. And after watching the staff in the physical therapy department, I became interested. And so I asked if I could volunteer. And uh, I began volunteering in the physical therapy department, was soon hired as a PT tech, as a physical therapy tech. When summer came, I worked uh, full time as a physical therapy tech and uh, bagged groceries in the evenings and weekends and made pizzas until uh, one in the morning. Did all these jobs so I could save money for my college uh, room and board since I was determined to get a scholarship. I entered Northern Illinois University in DeKalb on a full scholarship and uh, with thoughts of renewed hope and, and inspiration. <clears throat> I was uh, the only one in my family to go to college out of all 12 of us and my father was very unhappy about it and fought me hard. He wanted me to go into a trade like printing or bricklaying and he made it clear he wasn't going to give me a dime of help uh, because he was very much against my going to college. But when I headed off to college I did have thoughts of renewed hope and inspiration. I'm stressing the word thoughts here because a few of you in this room know that I've had a lifelong friendship with Father Daniel. And Father Daniel's been my spiritual mentor for the last 49 years. The first time I met Father Daniel, I was 10 years old. My own father took me on a retreat to the monastery where Father Daniel's a monk. That weekend, Father Daniel and I made a heartfelt connection. And we've communicated virtually every Sunday for the last 49 years. In the early years, by letter. In the last 35 years, by telephone. And even though my own father stopped going to the monastery a few years later, when I got old enough to get my driver's license, uh, I would take myself. And Father Danny and I continued the friendship all these years. And we've always seen each other at least once or twice a year. Father Daniel is now 104 years old and is going very strong. Has been a part of every major decision of my life. I just learned uh, a month ago, for those of you that, a few of you in this room have even met Father Daniel, um, that the Vatican believes that he's the oldest living Roman Catholic priest today in the entire world. And, uh, and the key is that uh, he's never deviated from his routine. Now Bill from Baker Tilly told me that he was thinking of going part time and, and slowing down and I said, that's a mistake, you'll, you'll die. And I said, well, what, 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 you, what you want to do is keep up your daily routine because once you slow down, uh, that's when your mind and your body goes. And, and I've watched Father Daniel, that's been a secret, he's never changed his routine. I have a million, million stories to share with you, but a quick one uh, that I'd like to share is that uh, Father Daniel is a Trappist monk and they're cloistered so they're not allowed to leave the monastery uh, except for health reasons. They also follow a very strict diet of no meat, fish, eggs, or sweets. And they used to sleep on straw mattresses in the early years. So for close to 50 years, Father Daniel had never left the monastery. As he became older, I helped him with his doctor's appointments where he'd need to leave the monastery for a day or two for medical testing. And uh, I remember like it was yesterday, the first time I went to pick him up, I took him for his medical test. And uh, that night I brought him back to my house for dinner. And uh, when you're outside, when the monks are outside the monastery, the strict dietary rules don't apply. So we ate a nice dinner, food that he had not eaten in years, and I thought I'd play a joke on him. Uh, my wife had made a chocolate cake, sheet cake, uh, for, with chocolate icing for dessert. So I went in and cut the sheet cake in half, and I put it on a big turkey platter. And then I took a full half gallon of vanilla ice cream, peeled the carton off, and set that in the center of half of the sheet cake. Then I very nonchalantly just kind of matter of factly walked out and placed it in front of me. I said, you know, here, Father, is your dessert. And I expected him to say, oh, wow, I could never eat all this, and we all share at the table. Instead, he just very humbly said, thank you. And he picked up his fork, and I kid you not, proceeded to eat every bit of it. <laughs> and, 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 and I guess after not eating his sweets for 50 years, he deserved it. <laughs> but. Uh, but going back to thoughts, Father Daniel has always stressed to me the supreme power of our minds, our thoughts, that can be our greatest assets and sometimes our greatest enemies. He'd say that our thoughts really determine our attitudes and our moods, and our attitudes have a lot to do and play into the decisions that we make each day and the actions we take, and that our actions through life 
really determine how we end up. Uh, the other comment that I always liked or saying is he'd always say, it's not what happens to you in life that counts, it's how you react to it. During the summer though, after my uh, last year of college, when I was working as a physical therapy tech, uh, I met an aspiring young woman, an x-ray technologist at, um, uh, when I, at Rockford Memorial Hospital. And uh, the way that she approached her work was such caring and a smile, always, a smile always on her face made a real impression on me. So one day I saw her in the hall and I got my confidence up and I asked her if she wanted to go uh, feed the ducks at a pond after work by the hospital. And uh, you know, you gotta remember being in the summer I wasn't all that educated on dating strategies and this was kind of the most suave idea uh, <laughs> that, that, that I could come up with. And she, and she looked at me kind of strangely but said yes. And I learned later that she had been asked out on a lot of first dates to dinners and to movies but never to go feed the ducks. Uh, but the key was the date cost me a loaf of colonial bread which was 29 cents. When, uh, we walked and we talked and we listened to each other for many hours that day and we fed uh, the ducks with that magical loaf of bread and we learned a lot about each other. And I learned later that she went home that night and told her mother that she thought she was in love. And uh, three weeks later we were engaged and eight weeks after that we were married. Now, my wife and I definitely do not want our kids to know this little part of my personal story. <laughs> so it's very important that we keep this little secret just between us in this room here. And uh, Jim, that's one of the comments that's off the record. Uh, but that's very much of a true story. I know that comes as a shock to you, uh, except for those of you that have watched the Mercy Emergency North Building go up on Deerfield Drive, you should probably know that I am and always have been one to work under tight deadlines. And, um, but today, the good news is, is that 38 years and six children later, and my wife Vita still makes a little loaf of bread uh, each year on our anniversary. During college at NIU, I decided I wanted to become a physical therapist, and I knew I had to be accepted to physical therapy graduate program at the Mayo Clinic because it was the only physical therapy school in the country that didn't charge tuition, and actually provided a monthly stipend to cover room and board. And I think because of this, probably every college student in the country that wanted to go to physical therapy school applied there. They've got over 2,400 applications for 40 spots. So in the fall of 1973, after our summer whirlwind romance, Vita and I moved to Rochester, Minnesota, uh, so I could attend graduate school in physical therapy at Mayo. After I finished my graduate studies, I spent a year as an administrative intern for the Franciscan Sister CEO of St. Mary's Hospital, part of the Mayo Health System. This internship was really difficult to get, Many people wanted this internship, and so you may wonder, well, how did you get it? Well, I was walking home one night after work, and I saw a little nun that stands about five feet, one and a half inches tall, working in the garden behind the hospital. And she was struggling and left a heavy bucket, and so I asked her if she needed help, and she accepted gratefully. And then she proceeded to hand me a shovel. <laughs> and as, as nuns will do, and so, I, uh, so I, uh, I got the hint and I helped her turn the soil over in her garden for a couple hours. But we talked a lot and she uh, asked me uh, where I worked and I told her and we talked about a lot of things but she asked me what my goals in life were and I told her and uh, one of them was that uh, someday I'd hope to go into hospital administration. A few days later I was working in physical therapy and my supervisor came up and said, Javon, you're being called down to the CEO's office. And you can imagine how I was feeling. My mind started to race like, okay, what did I do now, you know? And uh, I, um, I didn't know who the CEO was of this big hospital part of the male health system. I walked in the CEO's office and behind a desk was this little nun that I'd helped in the garden uh, a few nights before. She had never told me that she was the CEO. Uh, she told me that she was offering me an administrative internship and I'd be working under her. So I think this is kind of an example of good things coming from always doing the next right thing. Maybe being in the right place at the right time, but also doing the next right thing. Because if I hadn't offered to help, it wouldn't have mattered to be in the right place at the right time. I think we all need God to open doors and break down barriers in our lives for us, but we have to suit up and show up each day and always do the next right thing. After my one year internship, I was accepted at the University of Minnesota during a master's in hospital and healthcare administration and a full scholarship. And when I finished my master's in hospital and healthcare administration, I was honored to have the same sister CEO 
asked me to come back and serve as one of only three operating vice presidents, reporting to her as the CEO of the 1,250-bed St. Mary's Hospital, which is one of the largest two or three hospitals in the country at the time. I was 26 years old and had responsibility for a large number of St. Mary's and Mail related departments making regular presentations to the board of directors at the Mail Health System. Most department directors who reported to me were twice my age and their department budgets were larger than many community hospitals' entire budgets. These same much older and very experienced directors had known me two years before as a neophyte administrative intern and here I was coming back two years later as their boss. So you can kind of imagine uh, the challenge that it was for everyone involved, at least for the first couple of years until I proved myself. Um, we, I know that that may be hard to believe, but we always have a healthcare expert on the board. And uh, Tom Poo is an administrator at Mayo, and he knows all these stories I just shared with you very well, because it kind of is part of the Mayo Clinic folklore. Uh, it makes me wonder today, though, what Sister was thinking when she made me a vice president at such a young age of such a large hospital. I think what she basically did was give me an opportunity to prove myself, although on a very large stage. Uh, she was known for having an iron fist, but in a velvet glove, although sometimes she was only an iron fist. Um, in fact, I replaced a very experienced vice president who just found her too demanding to work for. Uh, I think what, um, for me though, again, compared to my father, I found her to be a real softy. <laughs> and, uh, what the, uh, what the vice president, what the vice president, I think, referred to as demanding and pressure, she called excellence. And the sister's a lot younger than Father Daniel. She's only 93 today, and I uh, spent two hours with her, uh, visiting with her the weekend before last, and I found myself having to take out a pad of paper and pen and start taking notes because she was still imparting her um, wisdom, uh, pearls of wisdom, I mean. She's a great administrator, and I think so much so that um, she was the only administrator in Mayo's history that they ever named a building after uh, while she was still alive. It seemed like all the rest had to die first. Uh, but she was also a very, very great uh, mentor as well. I've tried to pass this opportunity on, and over the past 22 years at Mercy, have accepted 33 year-long master-level administrative fellows from the universities of Minnesota, Michigan, and Notre Dame. UW-Madison does not have a master's program in healthcare administration, but many of the fellows that have come to us grew up in Wisconsin and wanted to return to Wisconsin. And one of these fellows we just recently promoted to vice president. So after spending almost 10 years at the Mayo Health System, I joined the Dars of Charity National Health System as the chief operating officer of a large hospital in the Detroit area. We did some great things for this hospital over the years, but I didn't like the Eastern style or flavor of the Detroit area. And so I accepted the CEO position of Mercy Hospital in Janesville back in 1989. At that time, Mercy was in trouble, but really most people didn't understand it. The Compassionate Sisters of Mercy, the nuns who were still running the operations, had fallen on hard times. Few people understood how difficult things had become, and that even meeting payroll at times was a biweekly struggle. The volunteer board was looking for someone to help take on the challenge. I worked with the Mercy Self-Perpetuating Community Board of Directors, the same structure that exists today, to develop a plan of action. And when we began, hospitals were not able to successfully integrate that as employee physicians. The mechanics to make this work successfully on a long-term basis are very complicated and really not necessary to go into detail here. But suffice to say, physicians can understand working for physician-governed organizations but have a hard time working for organizations that are governed by non-physician volunteer board members because of many issues, both uh, cultural and financial. I, um, I, I know a fellow from Minnesota named Bill McGuire, and Bill started building United Healthcare at the same time, very similar time that I started building Mercy. And Bill uh, retired about four years ago with uh, 1.6 billion, that's with a B, in stock equity. Uh, and that's because he was given many hundreds of thousands of stock options uh, when he started at United Healthcare because it wasn't worth very much, probably pennies on the dollar. Um, and Bill used to say to me that uh, there's nothing like a little stock to help motivate physicians. But in the non-stock tax-exempt world, like Mercy is, uh, we don't have stock to motivate physicians. 
And so we have to find uh, many other means. And that's part of the secret of being able to work with hundreds of highly trained, highly specialized, uh, really renowned physicians and, and keep them motivated to give their all every day. Uh, this, um, but what's important is that the board and I continue to <coughs> pursue uh, changing the fundamental way that physicians and hospitals work together to improve patient services and a financial standing of the hospital simultaneously. This included the addition of many specialty and tertiary services like cancer care, neurosurgery, and open heart surgery to develop a health system that could take care of people from all ages. It wasn't an easy task. Our new family practice residency building was firebombed. My wife and children were threatened. One of my daughters was physically harmed and all my children were emotionally harmed. And that's when I realized that in order for me to concentrate on my work at Mercy, I needed to know that my family is going to be safe and so I moved them uh, to Minnesota. A hospital directly hiring physicians was extremely controversial then. But working together, we kept doing the next right thing, uh, driven by solid information and our vision for wanting to provide a better healthcare system for Janesville and the surrounding communities. Our goal has always been to bring the best physicians, staff, technology, and facilities to this area so that people don't have to leave uh, at some of the most serious crises in their lives and uh, oftentimes in life and death situations. And Mercy grew. We grew from a few hundred employees and one struggling hospital in Janesville uh, to a health system of over 4,200 employees, 385 employed physicians, three hospitals, and 68 multi-specialty facilities in 26 communities in a wholly owned and operated insurance company. And we're not done yet. We've grown from 33 million in gross revenue to over a billion in gross revenue. For years, Mercy was ranked as the fastest growing health system in the United States for same store growth, not as a result of mergers and acquisitions, uh, the way Bill McGuire did at United Healthcare. We've always grown from within ourselves. At Mercy, we're proud to have created a billion dollar health system, but more importantly, to have created thousands of jobs to benefit the area and providing over one million patient visits a year. But those are just statistics. If I had to summarize what the secret to success really is, it would be this. Listen more than you talk and always do the next right thing, no matter how painful the consequences or no matter how great the resistance. I'd like to share a couple of quick stories with you, which I'm sure some of you old timers will recall, because with resistance and pain can come controversy, and controversy oftentimes make headlines. The first story is about Mercy's intensive care unit. When I began at Mercy, all of the clinical physicians who had hospital privileges also had privileges in the hospital's intensive care unit. Wisconsin, like most states, simply grant generic licenses to medical school graduates to practice medicine slash surgery. And the state doesn't differentiate between a doctor's uh, specialized training. Uh, that's for hospitals to do. So the state doesn't differentiate between a physician practicing family medicine from open heart surgery. This is an extreme example, but it would not be illegal in a state size for a family physician to perform open heart surgery if he or she could find a hospital to allow him to do it. Not long after I began, a nurse came into my office and told me that a primary care physician working in the ICU on his patient had improperly intubated his patient. That is, he'd improperly put a breathing tube into the patient's bronchial tube. This resulted in a very tragic outcome for this young woman. I immediately decided that the right thing to do was to take the ICU privileges away from all physicians except for those physicians with specialized training in ICU procedures who could properly care for patients in the ICU. There was a tremendous amount, those of you that were here at that time, there was a tremendous amount of controversy and resistance from the hospital medical staff because of this decision. So much so that some of the physicians sued, saying that I was unjustified in taking her privileges as a way to practice in the ICU. The ironic part of the story is that in the year 2000, some nine to 10 years later, some Fortune 500 companies got together and developed a national leapfrog initiative demanding healthcare organizations who they contracted with to look for ways to make major leaps forward in the quality of care provided in American hospitals. After an intense study, a list of priorities was developed for making significant strides quickly in the quality of care of hospitals. 
Number one on their priority list, closing intensive care units to only those physicians who have specialized training in intensive care procedures. Number one on my priority list 10 years before, had, before the LeapFrog initiative was providing properly trained physicians for the safety and protection of our patients in the ICU and everywhere else in the hospital. Mercy patients were receiving this higher level of care almost a decade earlier before what the majority of other hospitals were offering even in the year 2000. I remember visiting a patient at a nationally renowned hospital in 2004 and was shocked to learn that they still had not restricted the ICU to only physicians properly trained in ICU procedures. And you'll find many hospitals today who've not done this. Why? Because the CEOs simply are afraid of the resistance and controversy with the medical staff for fear it will cost them their jobs. And why do they have this fear? Because they don't believe that volunteer board members, volunteer non-paid board members who don't have anything invested in the organization will stand behind them in the face of controversy. But I believed that under the steadfast leadership of our board chairman, Raleigh McCullen, that our board would stand strong behind the CEO's efforts in trying to do the right thing. And that's a big reason uh, why these changes were able to be made. Resistance and controversy, but always doing the next right thing. The second story has to do with our neurosurgery program. I was shocked when I came to Janesville that there were no subspecialty services available. One of the first physicians I hired was a board certified neurosurgeon. I did not want to put my family and this community at risk by living in a town without a neurosurgeon because an accident can happen at any time. We had a friend whose 10 year old daughter had fallen off her bicycle and hit the side of her head on the concrete. And with these types of falls, where you hit the side of your head on the concrete or the ice, you oftentimes break your temporal bone, which is a very thin bone, with the subdural artery behind it. When you break the temporal bone and cut the subdural artery, you get this release of blood in the brain. And, without the, and, and with the immediate availability of a neurosurgeon, the neurosurgeon can drill a burrow hole, release the blood pressure, and there's a complete recovery for the patient. Without releasing this blood in a very timely manner, you get severe brain damage. My friends rushed their daughter to the nearest hospital, unfortunately a hospital without a neurosurgeon, and my friend's daughter died. So we brought specialty after specialty, dozens of micro steps, to finally become a certified trauma center, with dozens of subspecialty services available for the people in Janesville and the surrounding area. Just last week I got a call from a father in Janesville whose daughter, or from Janesville, she, he was out in another part of the country, whose daughter had a serious accident in another part of the country and had suffered major facial and head injuries. He called me and wanted his daughter transferred to Janesville so she could be close to home and the family could get back to work, but he also wanted to know she could receive the right level of care. He started by asking me, my daughter's in an inpatient rehabilitation unit. Does Mercy have an inpatient rehab unit? Yes. Does Mercy have physiatrists, doctors of physical medicine rehabilitation? Yes. My daughter had been bleeding on the brain. If this starts up again, does Mercy have neurosurgeons to take care of this? Yes. Does Mercy have the right diagnostic physicians for this? Yes, we have full-time neuroradiologists. Uh, she's gonna need follow-up plastic surgery for these plates in her face, craniofacial and in her head. Do you have plastic and craniofacial surgery? Yes. He was extremely relieved that his daughter could, all, could get all the services that she was going to be needing right here at Mercy. One of my early inspirations in always doing the next right thing was a book I read as a kid, Profiles and Courage by John F. Kennedy. In this book, Kennedy profiled people through history who did the right thing even in the face of great resistance and sometimes significant personal costs. I began to learn this back at the seminary. I'm still glad that I asked my roommate for a toothpaste even though I had to kneel out on uh, trazo floors for many hours. I learned this again with my wife and children as our first daughter Sarah was born severely and multiply handicapped. A doctor friend of mine at Mayo had a son born in a similar way at the same time and he and his wife decided not to have any more children because they were afraid. They stated they were afraid of having uh, another handicapped child. Then I remembered what Father Daniel said to me. It's not what happens to you in life that counts, it's how you react to it. My wife and I decided to have more children. We ended up having five more children. Sarah lived with us at home till she was 23. 
She required help with all activities of daily living, including dressing, feeding, and toileting, which all five of her siblings were able to help participate with. Sarah participated in all family outings, activities, and vacations with us. All five of Sarah's siblings are doing very well in life, but the interesting part is that all five of them state that their success is due to the influence that Sarah had on them. And I see at Mercy every day, always doing the next right thing in action as I listen to the talented physicians, managers, and partners that work with me. Numbers award success. These aren't the things you strive for, but I think they're the result of staying the course and always doing the next right thing. I think what, at least the key to life, is to try to listen and serve and serve and listen. When we serve others in any capacity, it has a ripple effect. Uh, that's the uh, whole theme of that movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life uh, with Jimmy Stewart. It shows that what people, whatever you do in life, if you uh, serve others, it, it goes on and on. Homelessness is uh, really not part of healthcare, but 16 years ago, we listened to people coming into our emergency room uh, giving their cars as their address or uh, simply stating they didn't have a home. By listening, we learned how to serve better, and from our information, 16 years later, Mercy's still the only hospital or health system in the country running a homeless center, the House of Mercy. And you've seen Mercy's latest message, the one that says, you are greatest inspiration. The you stands for all of you that place your health in our hands. You who give us ideas on how to better serve you. You who inspire us to provide the best care. Better today than yesterday, better than anyone else, and better than you expected. The U also stands for all of our employee partners, our volunteers, our board members, everyone who helps us carry out our mission at Mercy. They too give us ideas on how to learn and serve you better and give us ideas on how to keep raising the bar of excellence, always doing the next right thing. I see every day dedication and caring in over 4,000 partners. And it's the people who make Mercy what it is. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of buildings. I'm grateful and humbled that this community places its trust in mercy and in allowing us to serve your health care needs every day. In closing, I'd like to share with you my favorite quote. Uh, and frankly, it's one that I've carried in my own heart since I've been 13 years old and first read it at the seminary. It was spoken by a wanderer, or in today's vernacular, a street person, to Francis of Assisi. Francis had already become well known by this time and he was leading somewhat of a procession of his admirers and followers down the streets of Assisi, Italy, when he was caught over by a crippled street beggar who whispered in his ear, be sure that thou art as good as the people believe thee to be because they have great faith in thee. In other words, be sure that you are as good as your children believe you to be, as your spouse and friends believe you to be, as your co-workers and employees believe you to be, as your customers and clients believe you to be, and as your students and patients believe you to be, for they have great faith in you. Thank you for inviting me to share my story with you today. <laughs>